Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nisha Trevetti, and I'm a senior consultant with MBA Mission. Um, thank you so much to, uh, to GMAT Club for having me. Um, and today I wanted to talk to you about the application process and specifically um, how to overcome a low GPA um, if that happens to be your situation. Um, so before I get into the presentation, just to tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I've worked at MBA Mission for several years now. Um, and before MBA Mission, I used to work in brand management um, and before that marketing research. Um, I got my MBA from the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. Um, and I did my undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, while I was an undergrad, took some marketing classes at the Wharton School. So I have a little bit of familiarity uh, with that program as well. Um, but with that, let's uh, go into the presentation. Okay, so first we'll talk about, you know, what is a competitive GPA anyway, when you're um, thinking about applying to business school and looking at your target schools and what they expect. Uh, next, we'll talk about how to overcome a low GPA if um, if you happen to have a lower GPA. Um, then we'll kind of go through a success story that uh, we've seen with uh, a number of our applicants who have had a lower GPA, but they've been able to overcome it with other factors uh, in their profile. Uh, and then at the end, I'll tell you just a little bit about MBA mission, and then we'll go into some Q&A. So first, you're probably wondering, well, what is the average GPA of some of the top schools? You know, what are they expecting in terms of my um, undergraduate performance? Um, and so here's a chart with just some of the, the top 14 schools and what the average GPA is for students who are admitted to that the program. Um, and this is data from Poets and Quants from uh, the class of 2021, the student profiles. But the thing is, these numbers only tell one part of the story, which is what is the average overall GPA for admitted students to these programs. But when you evaluate your GPA, you'll want to ask yourself more than, you know, how does my GPA compare numerically to the numbers that I see on this chart? Um, so when you're looking at your GPA and um, more importantly, when the admissions committee is evaluating your GPA, uh, you'll, both be asking yourselves a series of questions. So first is, what is the grading scale that your college used? Because as you'll see in the previous slide, um, the GPA is out of a 4.0, which is the US system, but different countries, um, different colleges have their own grading systems. And the good news is that the admissions committees are very familiar with various universities and grading systems around the world. Um, and so applicants don't need to convert the GPA themselves. The admissions committee will be um, prepared to evaluate it at face value. Um, so that's just uh, one thing, but of course they'll take into account, well, what is the grading scale for that respective university in that respective country? And they'll evaluate your GPA accordingly. Um, the next thing to think about was what was your major? Um, because there are some majors that are just notoriously very tough. Um, a lot of the hard science and mathematics are graded on a curve. And so admissions committees know that the grades that are going to be awarded um, by that major are not necessarily going to be um, you know, very high and they're going to be graded on a curve. And that's the sort of thing that they'll absolutely take into account. Um, the third thing is class rank. Um, some universities offer some sort of class rank system um, or uh, let's say an honors system, you know, first honors, second honors, that sort of thing in terms of graduation designation. And so they'll also take that into account. So if you have a certain GPA, um, but then your class rank, you know, you're top, like ranked at the top of your class, they're going to weight that ranking even more heavily because it really says something about your relative performance. Um, the fourth thing is, you know, did you work during college? Um, I've had clients who worked 15, 20, 30 hours a week while they were in college to support themselves financially. And the admissions committee absolutely knows that, um, you know, how challenging that is. And they'll absolutely take that into account when they're evaluating that candidate's GPA. Um, the next point is, did you have an upward trajectory? Um, because oftentimes, you know, somebody has an overall GPA that um, that's okay, but the GPA or the college performance rather started out slower. So freshman year um, in college, that first year can be a real period of adjustment uh, for people. So sometimes you know, 
the performance is not so good for that first semester, those first two semesters, but then oftentimes once students improve their study habits, once they learn how to prioritize academics more effectively, um, once they start taking classes for their major and um, it turns out to be a better fit, they end up uh, doing better. And so their sophomore, junior, senior years, uh, their GPA ends up having an upper trajectory. And this is something that admissions committees really like to see. So even if the um, GPA is low initially, if they finish strong, the students, that's something that the um, admissions committee values um, as they're looking at overall GPA as well. And then the last question, um, particularly important. So did you take any quantitative courses um, in college? And if so, how did you perform? And the reasons that uh, the reason that admissions committees care about this is that the MBA curriculum, particularly the core curriculum that students run into in their first year, is very heavily quantitative. And so they want to understand um, that the applicants are prepared academically for the rigors of this type of curriculum. So this is something that they will note as well um, in evaluating your overall college performance. And if you do, you know, let's say you looked at those factors, um, your GPA versus that chart that I showed you or the or average GPA for the schools that you're applying to, and you see that, okay, it actually falls below that. And there are some points of concerns based on the previous slide in terms of your, um, in terms of the number of quant courses you took, maybe you didn't uh, take that many, maybe they didn't go well, um, maybe there aren't any extenuating factors, maybe your GPA was weak throughout, um, whatever it is, if you're concerned about your GPA, first thing is you wanna make sure that it's something that you address. Um, and any academic weakness actually that you have um, as you're applying to business school, you want to address that. Um, so most schools, I would say the majority, offer what's known as either the optional essay or the additional information section. And this section is designed for candidates to explain any deficiencies they see in their candidacy. And so this can be a low GPA for sure. That's one of the most common uses for an optional essay, um, or it can be used to explain lower test scores, um, any gaps in employment, um, if you're not able to get a recommendation from your current supervisor, the optional essay is sometimes used for that as well. Um, but nonetheless, you know, whatever your situation, if you fall into one of these categories, you want to be able to own the narrative. So if you have that low GPA, um, you want to be able to explain it. Because if you don't, if you just, you know, present it in your application and, and don't write this optional essay, then the admissions committee is going to come to their own conclusion and they're going to decide, okay, well, why didn't this person do well in college? Let's figure it out just based on the information we have here, the transcript and anything else, and that's limited. But again, what you want to be able to do is own the narrative. So if you have a story, if there is one or more reasons um, driving your low GPA, make sure to explain that. And in the bullets, I've actually given some real life examples of optional essays I've seen that explain various reasons for having a low GPA. So the first bullet, so it says, adjusting to college life at first was difficult and I struggled to balance my academic requirements with my newfound social freedom. So this person is writing about how, you know, frankly, when they got to college, they really were enamored with the social scene and they prioritized that. And as a result, their grades did suffer. Um, and so they're, they're owning that. They're saying, you know, that was, but that was five years ago. And and then they go on in this essay to say that once they improve their study habits, once they um, realize that they really had to prioritize academics, they their GPA improved. And this is the classic scenario of a person whose GPA was low freshman year, but then they improved in later years. Um, the second bullet um, is referencing uh, work that a uh, candidate was doing while they were in college. They were supporting themselves financially while they were taking classes. They were working 20 hours a week. Um, and so this is something that they just simply want to explain because that way the admissions committee will know that they'll be able to evaluate the GPA in the context of the fact that this person had this you know, really big work commitment. And so that's something that they'll take into consideration when they're evaluating uh, the candidate's GPA. Um, the third bullet, um, it's about a candidate who maybe they majored in something. Let's say one of the, the most common scenarios, and I see this a lot when I talk to um, to consults or to clients, is maybe they started out in pre-med. They thought, okay, I'm going to pursue medicine, and so I'm going to major in biology, I'm going to take organic chemistry, and 
then they get into it the first few semesters and they realize, you know what, this is this is not for me. I do not want to be a physician. And, you know, these this classes in the hard sciences especially don't interest me, you know, and the, the grades do reflect that. Um, and then so let's say in their second year, they change majors. Um, they realize, you know, I already rather study, you know, econ or English or communication or, you know, a whole host of other things. Um, and then once they change majors, um, their grades improved. So their GPA was weighted down by some of those uh, hard science classes that they took early on in anticipation of being pre-med. Um, and so this is something to explain uh, as well. Um, and then the fourth bullet is just about, you know, extenuating circumstances. So, you know, I've also worked with candidates who um, got really sick at one point in college, um, whether it was early on or in the middle, and that um, made their grades suffer for a semester or a quarter or two. And so that's something that you want to explain as well, just so the admissions committee, um, when they see those low grades, um, they have an explanation to go along with it. And again, they um, you don't want them to jump to their own conclusion. You want to own the narrative and make sure they have all the information they need to understand your particular situation and the drivers of your performance. Um, then, you know, once you explain um, whatever was going on in college, so whether you had an extenuating circumstance or if you just, you know, made some decisions that you um, ended up changing later on, you also, once you do that, you want to make sure that you provide the admissions committee with other evidence of your potential to succeed in the program. So basically you're saying, okay, this is my GPA, but this doesn't define my academic potential. And so you want to provide other evidence of that. So some of these are, you know, your high standardized test score, um, professional certifications, additional coursework you've taken post-college, and your strong professional progression. And in the next slides, we're going to talk a bit about each of these. So first, standardized tests. I would say the best thing that you can do to offset a lower GPA is a strong test score. Um, and one, and by strong, I mean one that is at or preferably above the average of the target school. Um, so of course the test, which you're familiar with, there's the GMAT and the GRE. Um, schools accept the GMAT and the GRE equally now. Um, so you can take whichever one is suits your preference. And increasingly the executive assessment um, has become popular. So originally it was designed a few years ago for executive MBA candidates. Um, it's a shorter exam. Um, but now there are actually full-time programs um, that have started accepting it. And there's the few that uh, we know of so far, and there could be others, but a few that we certainly know of are Columbia, Darden, and Stern. They actually, even for full-time MBA applicants, they accept the EA. So let's say if you're in the position, you're kind of struggling with the GMAT or GRE, um, you could potentially switch to the EA and maybe that will work out better for you. So um, definitely what you want to do is give yourself plenty of time in terms of um, especially if you're concerned about your GPA, to nail that standardized test and first actually figure out which test you're going to pursue of these two or three, um, and then um, give yourself time to get as high of a score that you can so that you can show that this is a stronger indicator of your academic ability and potential um, versus a GPA that was uh, several years ago. And the good news is that schools do tend to weight the standardized test a bit higher than the GPA because it's um, it's a more uniform measure and it's more than likely going to be a more recent measure of your um, academic abilities. And for your professional career, some of you also have might have some designations. So for example, the, the CFA, um, the CPA, the, um, the PMP, Six Sigma, um, and then there's also the financial uh, exam series 63, series seven. Um, and so you might have some of these um, as part of your professional achievements. And admissions committees absolutely will take these into account as well, because they're just going to be additional markers of your academic ability. So maybe you have a low undergrad GPA, but you ended up getting the um, the CPA or the CFA a few years later. Um, and then of course you've taken the GMAT, GRE, or maybe even the EA. Um, and if you've done well on that, then there's a pretty big chance that the um, this designation, the certification that you have, and the standardized test in combination will really help offset that GPA, which you'll still want to explain in the optional essay, but the this sort of professional designation um, or certification can be very helpful as well. So if it's if you have the certification, you know, great. If it's something where before you apply, you have a chance of getting to the CFA next level or earning that CPA or passing that um, series seven exam, then definitely, you know, do so because that's going to help 
um, strengthen your academic part of your profile. Um, the other option is building an alternative transcript. And what this means is taking courses after college before you apply to business school um, in quantitative disciplines. And you know the areas we recommend are economics, um, specifically microeconomics, because that's quantitative, um, calculus, statistics, accounting, finance. So let's say if you were to take a course either locally, um, a little hard to do right now in, in the time of COVID, but or an online course. Um, and if you take this course and if you get an A, or the highest uh, grade, um, depending on what the grading skill of that course is, this can really help assure the admissions committee of your academic abilities and potential. And as a bonus, it can also help prepare you for the core curriculum of business school. Since you know, if, you have, if you've never seen accounting, um, and if you take an accounting class before business school, um, or statistics, or something like that, it's going to also make your life easier. So there's a double benefit to this if you are thinking of taking a class to boost the academic part of your profile, especially if you know if you have a low uh, GPA, um, or if you have a strong GPA but it just didn't involve um, many quantitative courses, or if any, or if you're also if you're worried about the quant subscore of your GMAT, um, an additional course is a really good idea. And I have some specific recommendations here. There are many uh, courses out there, but these are some really popular ones that I recommend to people. Um, the most hardcore one, as the name would suggest, is HBX Core, and it's a it's a course that takes several months and um, it's a very, very rigorous pre um, MBA prep program. Um, there's also a UC Berkeley extension course called Math for Management that I recommend to a lot of people. It's a graded course. It takes a couple of months to complete. Um, so it's one to look into as well. You could also, depending on the situation, you could also take a local course um, in econ and statistics and corporate finance. Um, calculus and statistics are ones that I really recommend or or calculus, statistics, and accounting are the ones I recommend the most since they're so quantitative. Um, but yeah, you could take this um, at a local course, college, even a community college uh, is fine. Um, the preference though is that the course is graded um, because it's not just the completion of the course that will help, but also just getting that high grade, the highest grade possible is what will help um, boost that, quanti that quantitative part of your academic profile. Um, another course that I sometimes recommend, it's called MBA Math. Um, this one's less rigorous. It takes just a few weeks to complete um, and it's not graded, but it's a good supplement if you've already taken a course and you just you know wanna have just one more under your belt, or if you, based on your application timing, if you don't have time uh, to take one of these other courses, um, then you can take MBA Math um, and it is well-respected by the admissions committee. Um, so that's another one as well. But again, I re recommend it usually as not the primary course, but a supplemental course or a course if you don't have time for one of the others. Um, and so now I wanted to, you know, now that we've kind of seen what are the ways to mitigate a lower GPA, um, I wanted to show you um, kind of through the scorecard that it is something that can be done. Um, and so the scorecard isn't about one particular person, but we've seen multiple, multiple people um, succeed with this lower uh, GPA. So um, this candidate, um, you know, GPA was low in college. It could have been because the freshman year was tough. It could have been because they majored in something initially that they weren't thrilled with. Um, maybe they had some other distractions, but bottom line is, you know, they did have that low GPA. Um, but they did very well on the GMAT. Um, they scored uh, above the school's average. Um, they didn't have any other certifications or anything like that, but the GMAT was strong. Um, they had high professional impact and initiative at work. And um, one thing I should mention is that in the optional essay, um, in addition to mentioning other indicators of your academic success, your GPA, your, your GMAT rather, any courses you've taken, if you do some really uh, quantitative work, um, you can mention that as well. And that's what this person did. They mentioned their professional impact and initiative in their application. And they also mentioned their quantitative work in their optional essay. Um, they had achievements beyond the professional sphere as well. This person was very heavily active uh, in their community um, and had shown leadership impact there. Um, in the applications, they had communicated goals that were ambitious, um, but that were realistic. They were a natural outgrowth of what they had done pre-MBA, and it was very clear how the MBA would help them achieve the short and long-term goals that they communicated. Um, and they communicated a strong fit with the target program. They made it very clear, why is this particular program right for them based on its culture? Um, and that's based on conversations they've had with students and alumni and the virtual uh, events that they attended. Um, this is based on their 
firsthand knowledge of resources within and outside the classroom that are related to their career goals. And they managed to really make a strong case for why they belong at the program and why uh, how they're going to contribute to the program based on their experiences so far. And so overall, had a very strong application execution, very thoughtful essays, including um, a very honest uh, optional essay, strong recommendations that attested to the candidate's performance and potential and growth, um, a resume that showed their achievements, both within and outside of work, a strong interview in which they made a good case for themselves and really showed the interview or um, you know what they were about. Um, you know the, all the short answers and all the other details in the application were ticked and tied. So they submitted the strongest application possible, and because of that, they were able to succeed and get into top MBA programs despite having a, a GPA that was below the average of the program. So rest assured that you know. A, a low GPA in and of itself is not going to end your candidacy as long as you, you know, one, you explain it, two, you mitigate it with other factors, and three, you make sure that your other application elements are executed in a manner that's as strong as possible. So next, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about MBA mission, and then I'm very happy to answer your questions. So uh, about MBA mission, um, we are a full-time MBA admissions consulting firm. Um, and we are, um, we're really excited that last year we were named the number one firm by quotes, quotes and quants. Um, on GMAT Club, we're the uh, highest rated firm, um, have a bunch of uh, verified reviews. Um, and because of that, we're the only admissions consulting firm that's recommended by Manhattan Prep. Some of you might have taken Manhattan GMAT or GRE for your prep. Um, they always recommend MBA mission. Um, and one of the things that sets us apart is that uh, my colleagues and I actually do this full time. So we're not balancing this with a full time job, um, you know, doing this in the evenings. We are day in and day out working with applicants, helping them put their best foot forward. And we're also always keeping up with uh, admissions practices and trends. Um, and so that's something that really puts us in the position to help candidates uh, do their very best with this process. And um, we have, uh, in addition to events like these where um, we're all present. We also have MBA mission uh, webinars every month. So check out the events tab of the mbamission.com website. Um, we have a bunch of free guides. And um, also if you haven't done this yet, um, definitely I recommend that you sign up for a free 30 minute consultation. Um, you can do this with me or with one of my colleagues um, on our website. Um, everybody gets one. So if you haven't done this, this is something to really take advantage of because um, during this 30 minutes, it'll be focused solely on you and your profile and your target schools, and you'll get some just really valuable advice no matter how you uh, decide to proceed. And uh, these are some of our services, which you can also read more about um, on our website. And this is just to tell you about some of my colleagues um, and the diverse backgrounds that they've had. Um, which really put them in a position to uh, be able to um, help candidates because um, they've had some really cool careers themselves, um, you know, journalism backgrounds um, and some positions at some very cool companies. So definitely you would be in good hands uh, with uh, with any one of us for sure. And um, yeah, so here's some information on how to contact MBA Mission. Here's how you sign up for the consultation if um, if you haven't done that yet, and then definitely check out our resources. Um, but with that, happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. So I'll stop the screen share uh, for now. Okay, so uh, we have our first question. Um, how would you define the meaning of a low GPA? Um, good question. So in one of the charts, um, you saw that there was a, the average GPA of some of the schools, right? And so for the top 15 US schools, let's say, the average GPA is gonna be anywhere between a 3.4 to a 3.7. Um, so yeah, so let's say, just for the sake of simplicity, the average GPA for our top school is like a 3.5. Um, let's say your GPA is a 3.2 three or a 3.2. Um, so on one hand, you know, it is below the average for that program. But as I mentioned, that's not the whole story, because it's also going to depend on you know, how rigorous was your major and were there other factors going on? And did you do well in your quantitative courses? So you want to kind of take both of those pieces of data, put them together, and then come to the conclusion of, is this GPA something I should be concerned about? 
when I'm applying to this program? And if the, the answer is yes, then you'll want to uh, make sure you pay attention to the other mitigating factors. But the first step is to see what's the average GPA of the school? How does your GPA compare? And then what are the drivers behind your GPA? And then you can see how to best communicate it and how to best mitigate it. Okay, so Sudhir is asking, can I mention my startup initiative as a reason for low GPA or gaps? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say anytime that you had something going on that you felt kind of detracted from your academics is something to explain for sure. Um, but you want to do it in a way that shows ownership and responsibility, right? So maybe the startup initiative that you were working on, it sounds like, you know, maybe at the expense of classes or studying, maybe it was a great experience and maybe you have no regrets. But in the optional essay itself, you want to mention that, you know, in retrospect, I would have prioritized academics or I would have done X, Y, and Z differently. And that way the admissions committee can see that you've changed and that your thought process is evolved. And that once you get to the MBA program, you'll be able to well balance academics with the other uh, factors of the experiences that you'll have with the program. Mm -hmm. So Ginny is asking, yes, about courses like mbamath.com. Um, yes, so some of the courses that I mentioned in the presentation, one is MBA Math, there's HBX Core, there's UC Berkeley Math for Management, um, there's just taking a local stats, accounting, calculus class. Yeah, I do definitely think those can go a long way towards uh, mitigating a uh, lower GPA, especially in a if you didn't do well in your quant classes uh, in college or if you didn't take very many, um, then it can really help. Um, I would say, you know, the first priority is to get the standardized test score um, in good shape because um, the vast majority of programs still require a standardized test score with a couple of exceptions. Um, but also, if you are concerned about your GPA, it is a really good idea to take one of these classes because it has a dual benefit. One is to help assure the admissions committee of your academic capabilities, but then the other is, of, of course, to give you some extra preparation before business school if you are not familiar with something like stats and accounting, and that can be very beneficial as well. Okay, so Yunke is asking, I have a 2.8 GPA, but I have the CFA and the ACCA. Can I explain it this way in the optional essay? Yes. So what you'd want to do in that case is first just acknowledge, first of all, that, you know, I want to address my 2.8 GPA, which I'm aware is below the average of students admitted to, um, let's say, to Kellogg, to Haas, to CVS, to HBS, whatever the school is. Um, and then first, you do want to explain um, the driver behind that GPA. Um, so, you know, did you have one of the factors that caused it? Did you work during school? Was there a particularly rough semester? Did you start out slow because adjusting to college was hard? So think about what were the factors that led to a low GPA? And then you'd want to turn to say, but since then, I've demonstrated strong academic readiness or strong academic achievement. And then you'd mention the CFA, the ACCA. Um, and then hopefully alongside that, you also have a solid uh, standardized test score um, that you can explain. And given that you have the CFA, I presume that you, of course, work in finance and that you have um, strong quantitative uh, skills that you demonstrate at work. And so that's another thing to mention in the optional essay. Um, and those factors are going to help uh, mitigate the low GPA, maybe not 100%, but they will certainly go a long way. Okay, so um, yeah, another question. So yeah, Harvard actually, yeah, you're right, they do not have an optional essay. Um, so they you know, in most, the majority of programs you're going to see has an optional essay. The length is going to vary a lot. Sometimes it's super short, sometimes it's long. Um, theirs is quite brief. So I think they have a, they don't have a separate optional essay, but they do have a short answer. So you just have to really get to the point and say, you know, this is what led to my GPA. And, you know, if you're not able to explain every single mitigating factor you have, rest assured that they are still going to be reading your application very carefully. So they'll be able to see for themselves you have a CFA. But what they won't be able to see from other parts of your application is what led to the 2.8, right? And so that is where you'd want to prioritize the very limited space you have to talk about what they can see. So what were some of the factors that they should be aware of that came into play when you were in college and that influenced your academic performance? Um, let's see. So, yeah, so um, Renal is asking, he's involved in extracurricular activities, um, took uh, some self elective, so the GPA is average. Um, will that hurt you? Um, no, I mean, the the application process, and that's kind of what the, the slides at the end um, illustrated, it is very holistic. Um, and so, 
they love seeing that candidates were involved in extracurriculars because one, it, it kind of shows a track record of leadership. It shows that you're an interesting person and it gives them the assurance that once you get to business school, you will um, be involved in the community outside of just uh, you know academics and recruiting. Um, and so, you know, you said, uh, you know, average GPA, but you'd have to define average, right? Because if your GPA is in line with the uh, the school, then, you know, that part is okay. But of course, to be then, then the question is, how are you a competitive candidate, right? And the, so that's where it comes in that you want to also get a solid score on your GMAT or GRE, or maybe even your EA, um, and execute a strong application, right? Which means to, you know, show how you've had a track record of extracurricular involvement, how you've had professional progression, how your recommenders are able to attest to your performance and potential as well. Um, so I think that's what's uh, most important is then just making sure your application is well-rounded and that you are casting yourself in the best light possible. And that is what will um, maximize your chances. Do all business schools place equal importance on GPA? Um, yeah, I mean, they all, um, academic performance is definitely going to be a pillar of one of the uh, criteria that business schools use to evaluate applicants. So they all, it's important to all of them. Um, but of course, the more competitive the program, um, the more, um, the higher the average GPA, right? So like I said, for the top 15 program, it's gonna be around a three five, maybe even a little higher, um, maybe a little bit lower for um, programs that are outside of that, um, at least in the US. Um, and so you, in any case though, you want to make sure you, you wanna see, well, where does my GPA stack up with the uh, school's average? And is there anything that I need to explain? Um, and then of course, the other parts of academic performance are the GMAT, the GRE, um, you know, if you have any other certifications, if you can take any other courses, um, you'll be able to see based on how you stack up with the school's metrics, whether whether those things are necessarily. But I would say that they all more or less weight GPA um, equally, but the average GPA could be different. Mm -hmm. So Akash is asking, what if there was no real driver behind the low GPA and you were just immature and didn't recognize the importance at the time? Um, many people have that situation. Um, I've worked with many candidates where it is just, you know, there are no mitigating factors. You know, I didn't get sick. I didn't, I wasn't working during school. I just didn't uh, take advantage of the great opportunity I had. And so you would just be very honest about that in the optional essay that first of all, you recognize your GPA is below average. When you're in college, you, you know, you aren't as focused on academics. You want to talk about what are you, you focused on instead, right? Maybe you are trying to figure out what you wanted to do career-wise. Maybe you just um, you know, maybe you just never really adjusted to the high level rigor of college versus high school. Maybe you're just involved in the social scene. Um, and so then what you'd want to do besides just explaining it very frankly um, and saying, here's what I would have done differently. Here's what I would do if I, I were given a second chance. That's when you, you would then point to what are more recent indicators of the fact that you do take things seriously. And again, this is going to be um, other academic indicators like your test scores, like any courses you've taken, um, like any certifications you've gotten. And in this case, it's going to be really especially important, I think, to take some sort of supplemental course. And then, of course, if you've had strong professional progression, um, you know, you've gotten promoted, you've gotten more responsibility, you have heavily quantitative duties at work, um, you uh, present to leadership. Those are the things that you'd want to highlight as well so that they can see that, you know, you're a changed person. That was you in college, you know, and in retrospect, you would have handled things differently. But since then, you really have fully maximized your opportunities and you have been focused academically in the work. And then Arjun is asking, uh, round two uh, deadlines are in about a month or two at most. Yeah, so there, those are coming up in uh, just two or three months. What's the fastest way to offset a very low GPA? Um, I would say first priority is going to be GMAT GRE. So if you aren't um, thrilled with your score there, take it again. Um, the schools do not frown on retakes. Take it two times, three times, four if you need to. That's the first priority because that's the more uniform measure of academic ability. So focus on that. And then if there's time after that, you know, HBX core, yeah, that, that'll take us several months. So a bit late for that. Um, and then the UC Berkeley course and other courses like that um, are gonna take at least a couple months. Um, one thing you could take a shorter course like MBA math, um, that is an option, but um, but if you're trying to offset a low GPA, a graded course can work better. So another option actually is you might enroll in a course and you might know that by the time I submit my application, I'm not gonna be finished. But what you can do is you can write in the optional essay, 
um, first, you know, explain your GPA, explain the factors that you feel mitigated. And then you can say at the end, um, in order to further demonstrate my academic readiness for your program, I have enrolled in, um, let's say, Berkeley Math for Management, I've enrolled in the statistics course. Um, and as soon as I'm finished, I will submit my transcript to the admissions committee. So they know at least you've committed to the course, even though you're not done with it yet. Um, and that can be helpful as well. And then of course, at that point, the sooner you finish it, the better, but at least you, you've kind of showed them that you're, you're on it and that can be valuable. Let's see, so the question is, I obtain much higher GPA and master's in finance. Um, Yes, that's a really good question. And actually, that's something I didn't cover is that, you know, some of you might have master's degrees. And I would say that overall, the admissions committee is going to be more focused on the undergrad GPA, because that's uniform across candidates. Not everybody has a master's, but um, everybody did um, go to undergrad. But your master GPA can help offset your undergrad GPA, right? And especially in your case, you know, the, the master's was in finance, so heavily quantitative subject. So if you did well there, it's certainly going to help offset your undergraduate GPA. And then of course, you know, you still wanna make sure you do well on the uh, standardized test, but I think that the master's um, in finance, while it won't totally offset the undergrad GPA, it is going to be very helpful. Okay. Um, yes. So if you're an international applicant, so of course, a lot of what I had in the presentation, it was about the 4.0 scale um, and that sort of thing. Um, but of course, in um, you know other countries, you don't have a 4.0 scale. The, the grading system is different. So for example, in India, I know that it's, it's out of 10 um, or there's a percentile or something like that. Um, the good news is that schools are very comfortable with grading systems around the world and university standards around the world. So you do not need to convert your GPA to a 4.0 scale. Um, the school, usually in the application, it actually even specifically says that, like don't convert your GPA, just tell us, just show us exactly what it is and we'll figure it out. Um, and so you don't need to um, be able to do that. And so in that case, if you do not have a, a GPA that's on a 4.0 scale, they'll just look at the GPA and they'll use their own um, criteria and judgment and their knowledge of your program and, and your country's rating scale to evaluate your relative, the relative uh, performance, your relative ac academic performance um, in that in that way. So that's that's how that works. And then Pranav is asking, um, what if one has a lower than average GPA um, in a minimal um, minimum requirement for the GMAT score, but solid uh, examples of career growth, diverse profile. Yeah, I mean, it's a holistic process, right? So certainly there have been, we've also had candidates who below average GPA, you know, GRE or GMAT is solid, but ne not necessarily above average, but it's, you know, it's about the average for the school. But, you know, if it, it really depends on what else is in the profile, right? So if you have really strong career growth, um, if you bring some diversity to the class, if you've had some really awesome experiences outside of work, that can help offset it. And so it's um, it's hard to predict. Um, we've I've seen success stories of people with a lower GPA and uh, a score that's you know maybe not completely enough to offset it, but they, if you have awesome other stuff in your profile, that can really help. Um, but uh, on the flip side, you know I've seen people with awesome GPAs and um test scores um not get into some top schools because it's the, the competition is here so i would say again the biggest takeaway here should be that the process of review is very holistic they look at not only academics but also professional performance which means the impact you made at work as well as the progression you've made at work and what your recommenders have to say about your performance your potential and your growth as well as impact you made outside of work in your extracurricular life and organizations within work um, maybe you made a huge impact on your family. And so there are different factors that uh, admissions uh, committees consider when they're trying to figure out who to bring into the class. And then this question is, um, if I'm a computer science engineering graduate, want to enroll in finance, um, then which course should we go for in addition to optional essays? Um, well, some of the courses, um, again, that I've recommended, well, one is HBX Core. 
um, but it depends how much time you have. Um, there are other courses like um, UC Berkeley has math for management. They have other extension courses. UCLA and NYU also have extension courses in quantitative subjects. Um, or you can take a course at a local college. Some of them might be doing virtual classes now in calculus or statistics um, or accounting or something like that. So what I would think is, you know, as a computer science um, major, you might have taken certain quantitative classes already, right? So I would say that the courses you should take to supplement your transcript should be courses that you either hadn't taken in undergrad or courses that you hadn't done well in. So if you had not taken statistics as part of undergrad, that's a great choice. Or if you didn't do well in statistics, that's also a good choice. But if you took stats already, you did pretty well in that, but maybe you'd you've never seen accounting, maybe then accounting would be a good choice. So definitely it, it depends on what you have taken um, and what courses are available to you depending on your time frame and your, your budget. Does MBA mission only focus on US schools or can you approach you for HEC in SEAD? Yes, yes. So we focus on schools all over the world. So I've worked on NCAD. I'm working with a guy on Cambridge Judge right now, you know, Oxford. Um, so and actually on mbamission.com, we have insider's guides um, for the top US schools. And we also have a section for international guides. So schools like NCAD, schools like Oxford, schools like Judge, the business schools in Canada, um, of course, there are schools um, in, there's NUS and Singapore that I've worked on before, um, HKUST. So yeah, so the short answer is that yes, we work on schools um, all over the world. So the question is, if I'm planning to go into the finance field, will passing the CFA exams help offset a horrendous GPA? Um, well, the CFA is incredibly well respected. So if you pass the CFA exams, that will help a lot. Um, but it depends, you know, just how low is the GPA, right? Because, you know, if it's extremely low, like let's say we're talking like 2.0, that's going to be harder to offset than, let's say, a 2.8. Of course, I'm speaking in real uh, generalities here. And you might, of course, have uh, studied in a school that doesn't even have the, the 4.0 scale. So just kind of speaking generally, that um, it depends on just how low the GPA is and what the explanation is for the low GPA. Those are what is you, that's what's going to factor into the admissions committee's evaluation of it. But the CUFA is something that can help more than almost anything because of how rigorous and how well respected it is. Um, but even along with the CFA, what you'll want to do is um, do your best on the uh, standardized test as well. Okay, so any final thoughts or advice um, to round one folks on interviews? Sure. So um, one thing I wanted to say about the interview is, um, well, first of all, you know, sometimes it's pretty rare for the interviewer to ask about a weakness um, or a weakness with respect to your profile. Like once in a while they'll ask, um, but if you're concerned about your GPA and if they don't ask about a profile weakness, it's not something you have to bring up. Uh, that's something I would, I figured I would say just in the spirit of what we're talking about here. Um, but in terms of just round one interviews in general, you know, one advice I have, which is probably really obvious is to be yourself, right? Um, the interview, you want to be well prepared. You want to deliver thoughtful answers, but it's overall, they're really gauging what's the overall impression of this candidate? Do they seem enthusiastic about the program? Have they done their homework? Are we convinced that they need an MBA from the school and they're gonna gain as much as they contribute? You know, what is our final recommendation? And so that's the main thing that the interviewer is going in with. But I think the best things you can do to prepare in general are, you know, know your resume walkthrough, two or three minutes, um, have solid reasons for why MBA and why that particular program, and practice your behavioral stories. Um, the question they ask like, Tell me about a time that you demonstrated leadership. Um, tell me about a time that you had a conflict with a team member. Really know what are your stories and practice telling them so that you'll be prepared to do so in the interview as well. And of course, they're probably going to ask you, um, do you have any questions for me at the end? So make sure you have thoughtful questions that are tailored to the audience, whether it's an admissions committee person, an alumni, or a student. Um, and uh, MBA Mission, I believe I'm actually doing one in a few weeks. Um, we have webinars on interview prep. Um, so make sure you check that out, sign up. Um, they're also free. And we have uh, interview guides on our website. We also have an interview um, prep service um, if you haven't worked us with us before. So definitely check all of that out. I think you'll find it really useful.